Michelle Crosby Watson, and today we're going to talk about the various models that are available for investigating Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So um, let's first start with the simplest model, which are the cell culture models. There are many different cell culture models for investigating Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Some examples include the C2, C12 cells, which are derived from skeletal muscle from mice. These are very well characterized cells. It's an immortalized cell line. The cells can be differentiated into myotubes. We'll see an example of that in a moment. There are also stem cells that can be grown in culture and also primary muscle cells isolated from a variety of sources as well as primary fibroblasts taken, for instance, from the skin that can be transformed into muscle. There are many benefits of using a cell culture model to investigate Duchenne muscular dystrophy, some of which are that they grow very easily under controlled conditions and outside the natural environment. But as you can imagine, there are pitfalls. The cells in culture don't mimic the disease conditions or the immune system responses that are so much a part of this disease. Shown here are example of C2C12 myoblasts. These are single cells, muscle cells, that have an individual nucleus. Shown in this, these two panels are the cells grown at low density and at high density. The cells can be induced to differentiate and form these really wonderful thick myotubes that have many nuclei and actually can contract in culture. So the use of these myotubes has been widespread for studying certain aspects, particularly the mechanism of disease. There are several non-mammalian models for studying Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One is the worm model or the C. elegans model in which the dystrophin gene is targeted. These worms display a motility defect. In addition, there are Drosophila models which display flight defects. And there's also the zebrafish model, the most common of which is the sap J fish model. These fish have been really excellent at medium to high throughput screening of compounds that can modify the course of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So most scientists, though, when investigating therapies or drugs or the molecular mechanism of disease, choose an animal model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And there are several different animal models. Of course, there are many different lines of chemically and genetically engineered mice that mimic Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are canine models, rat models. There's even a feline and a pig model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we're gonna go over today some of the more commonly used models for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. When scientists are picking an animal model for investigating Duchenne muscular dystrophy, they have many questions to ask themselves. For instance, am I interested in studying the genotype or the phenotype of Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Do I need to use a small or a large model in order to study gait or mechanism? Am I interested in cardiac or respiratory defects? Am I interested in studying genetic modifiers of Duchenne muscular dystrophy? If so, I need to be very careful of background strains. And some scientists are interested in studying dystrophin isoforms that are expressed in non-muscle tissues. If this is the case, then one needs to be very careful in selecting the appropriate genetic model in which those isoforms are perturbed in those non-muscle tissues. And we're gonna see an example of that in a moment. The MDX mouse is a spontaneous mutation in a, in a mouse model. It was first described in 1984. This is the most commonly used mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I just wanna point out to you the original paper here again, 1984, in which it was described as follows. It is of considerable interest that a spontaneous mutation, MDX, arose in our inbred C57 black 10 colony of mice and that it is an X chromosome linked and produces viable homozygous animals that have high serum levels of muscle enzymes and exhibit the histological lesion similar to muscular dystrophy. The observation and discovery of this mouse really advanced research in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it is very widely used. So one of the um, disadvantages of using the MDX mouse is that while it has a mutation in the dystrophin gene, and in fact it has a mutation in exon 23 of the dystrophin gene, which leads to a downstream premature stop codon, the mice 
don't exhibit all of the extreme um, disease symptoms that are present in Duchenne patients. So these animal models are widely available now to researchers all over the world through a company called Jackson Laboratories, or JAX for short. The NDX mice display robust skeletal muscle regeneration, and there are also numerous compensatory mechanisms that are present in the NDX mice that cause the mice not to be as severe as Duchenne muscular dystrophy individuals. For that reason, scientists have created mice that are lacking two genes, the dystrophin gene and the most widely studied compensatory gene called eutrophin. We're going to learn a little bit more about eutrophin in the subsequent lectures. But suffice it to say for now that MDX mice can express an elevated level of eutrophin and that eutrophin can compensate for the function of dystrophin to a certain extent and that causes the MDX mice to have a relatively mild phenotype. So scientists Dr. Sains and Dr. Davies created a mouse model, often referred to as the double knockout mouse. This mouse, again, is lacking dystrophin and lacking that compensatory protein called eutrophin. Now, these double knockout mice, there are two strains of them that have targeted individually different regions of the eutrophin gene. These mice are actually quite severe in phenotype. In fact, you can look in a cage and easily distinguish double knockout mice from wild type mice. Now, if you were to look in the cage and see wild type in MDX, it would be actually quite difficult to distinguish them just upon gross inspection. So the double knockout mice are actually quite severe. They display a severe dystrophic phenotype. And these mice are often referred to as the phenotypic model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the MDX mice and the MDX eutrophin null, or the double knockout mice, are some of the most commonly used mouse models to study Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In addition, there are a host of chemically induced mutants of dystrophin. And what's really great about this collection of mouse models is that the mutations occur at different regions along the length of the dystrophin gene. And because there are seven different promoters for the dystrophin gene, it turns out that these mice can differentially affect different dystrophin isoforms that are expressed in muscle and non-muscle tissues. So what's shown to you in this slide in the upper schematic diagram is the gene structure. You can see the individual promoters in red and the exons that encode dystrophin are in green. Below that is the protein structure, showing you the N-terminus and the C-terminus, as well as the spectrin-like repeats. And below that, we have illustrated the different isoforms, including muscle and non-muscle isoforms, of dystrophin. And you can see, for instance, that the isoform called DP71 is ubiquitously expressed. Now, it's called DP71 because the protein is 71 kilodaltons. Similarly, DP116 is expressed in Schwann cells and um, encodes a protein that is 116 kilodaltons, and so forth and so on. Just want to point out that DP427 is the large form of dystrophin, and that is the form that is predominant in skeletal muscles, including heart. So, we have a panel of mouse models that span and disrupt different proteins that are of dystrophin that are expressed in other non-muscle tissues. For instance, let's take a look at MDX5CV, which encodes um, and disrupts a protein at um, DP427, which is the full-length skeletal muscle form of dystrophin. So these mice lack DP427, but retain expression of the other four isoforms of dystrophin. The MDX mouse, which is the most commonly used mouse model, also has a genetic mutation that only disrupts DP427. However, the MDX2CV mice have a mutation in the region, which is the spectrin repeat, 
And you can see that that genetic mutation will disrupt DP427 and DP260. So those proteins are not expressed in this mouse model, but the MDX2CD retains expression of DP71, DP116, and DP140. MDX4CV mice have a mutation also in the spectrum repeat, but this mutation affects expression of three isoforms of dystrophin. And lastly, the MDX3CV mice have a mutation that's closer to the C-terminal region of dystrophin, and that mutation affects the expression of all five isoforms of dystrophin. So scientists may choose to use one of these mouse models depending on their desire to study a dystrophin isoform expression in a non-muscle tissue. Most recently, scientists have used TALINS and CRISPR-Cas, um, which are genome editing techniques, to target various regions of dystrophin in the rat model. And this is a really exciting discovery. And what you're showing, what I'm showing you here below, is a dystrophin stain of a wild-type rat skeletal muscle. And you can see that in the wild-type rat, the brown stain nicely lights up the sarcolemma region of each individual skeletal muscle fiber. And in the DMD-MDX rat model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the dystrophin staining is largely absent. There are a few fibers denoted by the arrowhead that are positive for dystrophin. And those are what are referred to as revertin fibers. And we're going to talk a little bit more about revertin fibers. But some animal models have a more robust expression of revertin fibers, which are dystrophin positive. And DMD patients have very, very low to non-detectable levels of revertin fibers. Again, when we're thinking about the differences in selection of, of uh, animal models, we want to be very careful in understanding how the different animal models compare with the human disease. So, as we mentioned before, there is a canine model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And in fact, dogs get muscular dystrophy just like humans do. Remember that the dystrophin gene is one of the largest genes and is highly susceptible to mutation. So there are many different breeds of dogs that have developed muscular dystrophy. And some of those breeds have been isolated in the laboratory setting and are used for certain um, particularly preclinical studies to test out a therapy before that therapy is translated to humans. There's also a value for studying a larger animal model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's thought that that could more closely mimic the stresses and forces that humans experience. So the canine models show the same clinical pathology and the same histological characteristics of Duchenne muscular dystrophy that is similar to humans. As I mentioned, there are many different models of uh, canine muscular dystrophy. Probably the most commonly used model in the laboratory is the golden retriever model, also called the GRND dog. And this dog has a very severe dystrophic phenotype. We're going to see some experiments later in the course that are testing a very novel and exciting therapy on the dog model of muscular dystrophy. So the clinical course of um, GRND, the canine, most commonly used canine model of muscular dystrophy, is that there are sometimes some symptoms of neonatal fatality. Uh, the symptoms appear shortly after birth. There is a stunted growth, very obvious altered gait, as you'll see in some videos later on. There is also an involvement of the um, cardiac function. There is obvious lumbar lindosis. And um, there are very obvious joint angles that are abnormally acute, as you'll see in some of these photographs. So the upper photograph is of a normal um, golden retriever, and the bottom photograph is of a dog that has muscular dystrophy. This is the GRND model. And you can see that there's significant differences in the posture of these two animals. So in this particular table, we're showing you a comparison of the human dog, the most commonly used dog, the GRND, the DMD pig, the feline model, the MDX mouse, which is the most commonly used mouse model, and the newly generated rat model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so this table takes you through some of the common characteristics and shows you how those animal models compare back to the human form of disease. 
This is a more extensive listing of some of the clinical, manifest, clinical manifestations, histopathology, and a lot of the gene therapy strategies that have been used for the MDX mouse, the dog model, as well as the human model. And so take a moment to um, look at these various characteristics and see how these two different animal models compare to humans. So we've learned a lot about animal models for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we've also learned that there are many different models for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So take a moment and evaluate for yourself the benefits and pitfalls of using mouse models versus dog models for investigating um, disease and possible therapies. So we'll get you started. Some of the benefits of mice is that they're widely available to multiple investigators. So many scientists can conduct similar preclinical trials and compare their results. The mice survive long enough to be functional. The MDX mice have a near normal lifespan. We know that that's quite different from DMD patients. Mice are very easy to house. We have a reasonable sampling size and many mouse mice are born per litter. On the other hand, as we've just mentioned, some of the pitfalls for mice is that they have really minimal disease severity. There is a robust regenerative capacity in mice that just doesn't exist in humans. There is also the robust activation of compensatory mechanisms like eutropin that make the disease in MDX mice not as severe as it is in humans. So this is um, some of the benefits and the pitfalls to get you started. On your own, think about the benefits and pitfalls of using canine models to study muscular dystrophy. So that wraps up our first segment on animal models, and I look forward to seeing you in the second segment.